arrived at Stradishaw um, quite suddenly um, in the first week, the beginning of the first week when the refugees were just beginning to arrive. I think I was one of the youngest volunteers because I was um, had chosen to um, be a volunteer for the community service volunteers for a gap year between school and university because I wanted to spend a year, I suppose, helping other people rather than um, doing what I went on to do um, as an archaeologist. I think the situation at that stage was when very large numbers of refugees were arriving both day and night um, from Stansted Airport. And um, we, the volunteers, we lived um, on the campsite um, at one end of the complex and we just kind of did whatever needed to be done. Um, I think as a, a, one of the younger volunteers, I um, probably had less responsible roles, um, but I could drive. So I spent a long time or quite a lot of my time driving round in a, um, a van round various bits of the um, RAF complex with um, all sorts of things like toiletries and um, uh, that sort of thing that needed to be delivered to the refugees in different parts of the camp. And the camp at the time, I mean, some of the families came to live in um, houses that had been officers, you know, in family houses, but a lot of them to begin with were in um, dormitories, essentially, um, things that had been the officers mess or whatever. And of course, that was very, very crowded to begin with. And this created all sorts of difficulties with um, trying to get the right uh, things to the right place at the right time, if you see what I mean, from the from the store. Um, I I think that was the initial, you know, being around at the beginning to do that kind of thing. But as the camp became more established, so to speak, um, we stopped doing um, shifts. I mean, you could be on very long shifts, night or day, to begin with. But um, I then started, as well as doing that, I started, um, I was trained to work a switchboard. And so I used to spend a part of each day um, on the telephone switchboard for the camp. And um, this was, could deal with any sort of uh, call, you know. And um, so I had I had calls coming in to do with uh, families in the camp and to do with the administration of the camp and I had to basically find out who were, who needed what call and if necessary because there wasn't always an obvious person to deal with it to deal with deal with it myself and the other thing I did which was quite interesting um, was that I worked with the press officer to some extent at the time and therefore, if crews, I can remember a 24 hours, you know, BBC uh, 24 hours documentary crew arriving and having to take them round um, uh, and to show them various parts of the camp so that they could choose what to take. And similarly with uh, journalists from time to time when the uh, press officer themselves couldn't do, you know, there was too much to be done because there was an awful lot of interest um, in what was going on. So those are the main things I remember doing, but I basically did whatever needed to be done. I had to tell one family that their a member of their family was missing in Kampala. And um, I, had, I could also see, once I got to know some of the families a bit better, that there were um, families who had been quite wealthy in, Uganda, but had lost everything in um, having to leave Uganda. And the shock of that, I think, uh, the shock of, on the one hand, of losing family members and on another, the other hand, of losing their uh, way of life, often as shopkeepers, was quite traumatic. And I think that 
for some of them, this took a long time for them to get over. Um, I mean, there were some families who arrived and they had family ties already with the UK. And I think for them, in some ways, it was much easier because they could contact a family member in, say, Leicester or whatever. And this gave them some sort of uh, anchorage as to what was going to happen next. But it, I think for those who hadn't got that, and I think the overcrowding to begin with in Stradishaw really didn't help matters at all. One of the things, difficulties I remember quite clearly is that there were some tensions between different religions, between Hindu, we had Hindus, we had Muslims, um, we had Catholics from originally from Goa. And um, we also had, I think, one family who were Jains. And therefore, uh, and also Sikhs, of course, we had quite a lot of, lot of Sikhs. And therefore, the kind of tensions that you see in South Asia today were at times apparent in that rather overcrowded and stressful situation. I think it was the overcrowding that caused that caused it because um, you might have, you know, people of different religions and um, different ways of expressing their religious life all mixed in together. And that I think could cause problems. And the, I don't, I mean, we, I can remember um, uh, we celebrated Diwali, we celebrated Eid. Um, so there was, you know, um, and I can remember um, some Sikh celebrations. So there wasn't that it was, you know, it was it was part of the camp life. It had been hoped that the Ugandan Asians weren't going to arrive at all until the last minute. And um, the administration was, a mix, well, a mixture of, um, I mean, it was run by a group, you know, you know, a retired group captain. And there were people from the, you know, had been in the colonial service in India, if I remember rightly, one of them had been. Um, and then there were a few other civil servants, but mainly it was then volunteers. And the WRVS and the Red Cross were particularly important, but many of the um, the day-to-day -day things, um, even the departures office initially was run by volunteers. And um, I think that, uh, Bearing all in mind, I suppose, um, it was amazing it worked, you know. Once life in the camp became more established, we, as volunteers, we had um, opportunities to um, experience perhaps aspects of, um, well, the cultural life, not African cultural life, but essentially South Asian cultural life. And one of these was Bolly Bollywood films were shown once or twice a week um, in the kind of winter months. And for me, that was, I'd never you know, seen a film of this kind at all. And I, I found them quite intriguing. I really enjoyed them actually. And I think they were a way of, um, for everybody to relax, you know, in that kind of um, environment in which, you know, uh, they were familiar with Bollywood films, and, but everybody relaxed and enjoyed them. Also, um, we, towards the end, we sometimes went to eat with, you know, Asian families in the evening and they prepared whatever they were, you know, what wanted to prepare rather than the canteen food, which, you know, had its, had quite severe lim limitations and um so i discovered chili pickles for example uh with you know chili lime pickles and things that um i had never eaten before at all hot curries which i've enjoyed ever since so i think that that was a a good introduction they often expressed a wish to go to Southall or Leicester or um, anywhere where with a large Asian population ready. But many of the, um, what was eventually offered were of course council houses in Welling Garden City, Stevenage, Hatfield, um, Milton Keynes. 
And by the end of it, there was a sort of quite a large number of families who were difficult to resettle. And this was not usually of their own making. I mean, they were either particularly traumatized or they had disabled members of the of their families or some other reason which may not have been may have been less obvious and towards the end there was quite a lot of they would have to be sent to other camps there was a lot of persuasion going on that they should accept a housing in uh, one of these new towns um, rather than perhaps going off to places like Leicester or whatever um, and that if they didn't accept this housing, maybe they would be sent off to West Wales or whatever. Um, I did stay in, in touch initially with one of the Asian families, I think. Yes, I did. A couple of them, in fact. Um, but I went off to university um, uh, to do something very different, to study archaeology, ancient and medieval history. And after three or four years, in fact, I had lost touch with um, all, with it, not just the volunteers, but also with the, the Asian families as well. So, and I think it's the nature of the age I was, and, you know, that was just one stage in my life before I went on to do something different. I had no contact at all with the outside world, really, for six months, other than the odd day off. Yeah. I grew up an enormous amount uh, because, I was experiencing, um, I suppose, events at first hand, which were for the Ugandan Asians quite traumatic. And um, so I was, I was having to cope with a very stressful situation. And by the time I got to university, I could really see a difference, you know, between me as a uh, an 18 year old schoolgirl and me as um, a first year undergraduate. And um, I think that um, it gave me a maturity which many of the others didn't have, but it also affected my life in as much as I thought, well, this is the nearest I ever want to be to a war situation in my life because I could see the effects on um, the refugees. I think that life in the UK has changed in the last 50 years. And I think one of the things that has affected government attitudes is the housing crisis. Because there are no long, there are now huge queues, for example, for council houses compared with the 1960s. Um, I think that this makes it much more difficult to rehouse um, refugees. But at the same time, I think there's a, perhaps um, public attitudes has, have changed, um, which are completely at odds with perhaps a multicultural society in accepting more um, immigrants because it's thought that they would take people's jobs when in fact we have um, a labor shortage um, at this particular moment. Um, uh, so I think this, there's been uh, quite a lot, I think, of intolerance towards newer refugee populations. I think in terms of um, uh, Ukraine, I think the situation is different um, in public perception for a number of reasons. Um, and um, the, obviously the Russian invasion of Ukraine is something that has come um, uh, from completely from outside. And um, I think that also because Ukraine is on the edge of Europe, it's perceived in a different way. Um, but there, still the UK has accepted remarkably few 
refugees from Ukraine for, compared with somewhere like Ireland, for example.